Okay, so now we're live. I don't know if you can see that on your screen. We're live and recording. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I think I'm just going to proceed with the introductions as planned. Um, this is a panel on the ethics in an age of catastrophes. And I am Benda Hofmeyer. I'm a professor of philosophy um, at the University of Pretoria. And my work may be situated in the broad field of practical philosophy in the continental tradition. And it evinces an enduring fascination for the inextricable entanglement of the ethical and the political. But before I um, briefly introduce the topic, I want to also introduce my fellow uh, panel members. We have uh, Christine Jacobson to my the right, my right, my right. <laughs> I, I raised my hand. <laughs> yes, Christine is an ethics researcher and consulted working in the fields of organizational ethics and ethics at the frontiers of emerging technology. And then we have Anna Matani. And I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method at the London School of Economics. And she works on topics in formal epistemology, decision theory, social choice theory and the philosophy of language and is particularly interested in connections between these areas. And unfortunately, um, it will only be the three of us because our other three panel members have had to withdraw at the very last moment on account of unforeseen circumstances. So um, you will have to do with us. Um, but let me let me proceed by briefly introdu introducing the topic. Um, this panel has been tasked with considering the status and conditions of possibility of ethics in a time of global catastrophes. And in my initial thoughts around the topic, I, I thought we might consider questions, and these are the questions that I have already shared with the other panel members. Um, what is the status and the place of ethics today? Um, what are the conditions of possibility of ethics in a time of global catastrophes? Uh, and what are the urgent issues and critical questions that require ethical deliberation? And I was also wondering whether or not our age of catastrophes is truly different from earlier epochs. Or have the revolutions in science and information technology opened uncharted possibilities for political collaboration? Um, Perhaps the catastrophe that epitomizes them all as arguably the worst form of violence is war. One of the key, if not the main questions that confronts us here is whether the language of ethics, our ethical responsibility towards the other, the language that begins and ends with the supreme moral injunction against murder is not rendered merely derisory by the cunning of war propaganda, not to mention the silencing and death affected by the viscerality of warfare. Um, we know that morality is not ignorant of evil. It precisely opposes evil. The humanity of ethics is anything but an unwavering condition, but a struggle against the inhumanity of evil. But war in its various guises, whether I would wager it takes the form of violent, bloody conflict, humankind's thoughtless devastation of the earth and its resources and its wealth of species, or nature's backlash in the form of climate change or viral mutations of pandemic proportions, humans kill and are being killed. And in the process, humans are stripped of precisely that which makes for their humanity. So to be clear, I come from the perspective of Levinas's ethical metaphysics. And Levinas would say that in this sense, war is more than the opposite of morality, as evil is the opposite of good. Rather, war is the very suspension of morality. 
So the potential for catastrophe may be situated then at the level of the polar historical struggle of good versus evil. The other as needy and vulnerable, the self is self-interested. It is the, the very struggle of compassion against indifference at the interpersonal moral level and the struggle for justice against injustice at the social, economic, political, and environmental level. So when this struggle gives way to killing and war, catastrophe par excellence, morality and justice itself are suspended. What war signifies is neither evil nor nothingness, but indifference to morality. So the question then to the panel is, is there a way back from this zero point of indifference to morality to a place where ethical deliberation can take place? Now, Christine, you have a considerable amount of experience um, in advising companies in the corporate world regarding challenges, the challenges of moral decision making um, when the stakes are high. Perhaps you could tell us a little more about that. Absolutely, and with pleasure. And uh, Benda, thank you so much for um, a very thoughtful, um, provocative and um, insightful introduction. So I hope that we'll be getting back to that as well. Um, so um, indeed, I will be talking more from a business perspective um, to you today. Um, and we'll be then giving over to Anna, who will much more enlighten us on a much more philosophical perspective. So in predicting the impact of a crisis, um, whether that is a global pandemic or um, the violent invasion of the Ukraine, we are all navigating without a map. However, some decision makers have, have a greater impact on shaping both the current moment that we are living in, but also the future we will all be living in. So as an ethics consultant at Principia Advisory, I work with large businesses to really help them navigate some of these really difficult um, decisions and, and moments in time with the help of ethics. So ethical decision-making is important during the best of times, um, but sometimes um, uh, business can think that maybe this is a luxury that we can offload during times of crisis. So to the contrary, I am going to argue that it is especially during um, the times um, of crisis that we need ethics most urgently. We need its methods and its tools that it has to offer to business. So it is easy to get caught up in all the emotions and subjectivity and difficulty of each decision. And tough decisions demand an even more thoughtful approach to decision making rooted in ethical principles that help us to determine what the right thing to do is in a given moment. So ethics can guide our decision making towards consistently doing the right thing, enabling us to emerge stronger and with greater trust out of a crisis. So during a recent conversation with a senior executive, she expressed a sentiment that I am sure many of us will be able to share. She said that when the crisis has passed, I want to be able to say that at the hardest of times, I did my best to do the right thing. So during crisis, leaders are expected to make very difficult decisions with often far reaching consequences. And as we have seen, it is those times of crisis that expose whether commitments to do ethical business were only ever on the surface level, exposing those who might have used ethics to ethics wash their corporate brands while elevating those companies that have integrity even when things get hard. So the decisions um, leaders make during times of crisis will define them and their companies for the years to come. Ethics cannot be used as a fig leaf for business as usual, but instead must form the foundation of a renewed case for the power of the business and society, as well as its license to operate. So thinking purely in terms of shareholder returns is no longer a viable business model, as broader definitions of value encompassing a company's impact on its stakeholders, from investors to employees, customers, partners, regulators, local communities, as well as its commitments to society at large, is now at the forefront of business. 
So the war in Ukraine offers a stern test of companies' ethical capabilities and commitments. The dilemma they face will place stringent demands on their ability to weigh competing interests and demands and to deliberate on highly charged ethical issues. Leaders must make decisions with limited knowledge, predicting their impact, and have confidence and trust that the compromises and trade-offs are the right ones. These decisions are rarely simple, often bringing financial considerations into tensions with doing the right thing. Leaders must ensure that their company's response to unfolding events is consistent, transparent, and principled, and be cognizant that they will be held to the same standard in future crises. So in this period of urgency and uncertainty, leaders are faced with a number of tough de decisions in addition to um, the crisis in Ukraine. They must make decisions on big issues such as shifting geopolitical dynamics, alliances and powers, scenarios for economic um, recovery, the climate crisis and the future of work, responsible innovation and artificial intelligence, and the impacts these issues have on their decisions and vice versa often with little data to hand. So given this context of uncertainty, there are a few practical steps companies can implement to help them navigate this crisis as well as future crisis. So I want to leave you with three concrete steps um, business can take today um, to help prepare for that. So one is around purpose, the other principles, and the third one priorities. So the first point is around aligning decisions with companies' purposes. An organization's purpose should clearly articulate what an organization does, why, and for who. It expresses what the organization contributes to society, supported by its organizational values. And in times of crisis, purpose can, and in fact should be, the, fonda the foundation upon which the organization lays out the path ahead. The second point is around um, to follow agreed and actionable principles. So given limited regulatory guidance on ethical decision-making, it is important for organizations to structure their own response to the ethical challenges they face. Having a set of agreed and actionable principles that guide decision-making mitigates the risks of subjectivity, gut reactions, and biases. These principles should be tied to organizational purpose and values. They should be fair and justifiable to everyone affected by the actions of the organization and be sufficiently concrete and well articulated to ensure effective implementation. And lastly, um, it is to prioritize and plan decisions and actions. So a clear purpose combined with a set of actionable principles provides organizations with the foundation of ethical decision making. However, it is um, equally important for leaders to know how to prioritize their decisions, especially as they are faced with new challenges and trade-offs during a crisis. So it is important to consider the severity and the urgency of the issues at hand, the future state um, that a decision will lead to, as well as the availability of resources. So, and most vital consideration in addition to that is to carefully think through the impact onto, on vulnerable groups, as well as unintended and harmful consequences. So just to wrap this up, um, ethical decision-making is important during the best of times. And we see more and more businesses being much more proactive and realizing that ethics is, a fu is fundamental to their business and market position. And it is not a luxury to be uploaded during the times of crisis. In fact, it is during times of crisis that we need ethics and business the most. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Christine. Um, I think it is. Um, I think the, the the world of business is in a very impo important uh, context within which um, um, larger scale catastrophes like that of war. Um, may be thought through, especially given the fact that um, economics and politics might be argued to be forms of war uh, waged in different formats. So many of the same challenges that we face when we think of war are the very same challenges that businesses face. So thank you very much for um, giving us some concrete pointers to work with. Um, Maybe Anna can pick up from there um, and just explain maybe um, how decision theorists might, might proceed with, because Christine spoke about um, planning and prioritizing your decisions and your actions. 
according to agreed upon and actionable principles. And maybe, Anna, you can provide us with some some concrete philosophical theory on what steps we may take to realize that. Yes, thank you. Really interesting. Um, yeah, I do want to pick up on um, some of the things you both said, and I have some questions I want to follow up on as well. But I'll, yeah, I'll start just by, um, I guess, setting out how philosophers and decision theorists standardly think about taking decisions. Um, we have some clean sort of textbook cases of decision making. And I guess I just want to show how different those textbook cases are from the real life decision making that we make. Um, well, I would call it in conditions of severe uncertainty, um, which would include times of crisis and catastrophe. I think I can share my screen. Um, let me just see if that works. Yeah, here we go. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Lovely. OK, so I'm imagining um, a person who has to choose between two different actions, action A or action B. And to start with, we'll imagine a case where this person knows what the outcomes will be. If they do action A, they get outcome 01. If they do action B, they get outcome 02. So all they have to do to choose between these actions is put these outcomes in order. Which outcome do they prefer? If they prefer O1, obviously they do A. Um, if they're indifferent, then they can take either action. Now, of course, when it comes to ordering outcomes, like which outcome is the best, that's actually very complicated, right? Because um, it might be the case that I prefer outcome 01, but you prefer outcome 02 because we're differently affected. And so then we'll have to balance the needs of different people. Even if it's just affecting one person, it can be hard to know what order to put them in because we have short-term desires and long-term desires. So there's all sorts of questions about how outcomes should be ordered. And actually, um, Christina, what you said about principles is something that might help us order these outcomes. Maybe we could come back to that idea. Um, but standardly in, in most decision-making contexts, you don't know what the outcome of your actions will be, right? There's gonna be some uncertainty, some risk, and standardly a decision theorist would represent it like this. Um, so now we have events, um, event, let's say event E and event E star, two different events and we don't know which one is going to happen. Um, and so here I have our probabilities in each. We have a probability of 0.7 um, that event E will happen, and a probability of just 0.3 that E star will happen. Um, these probabilities are kind of like chances going from zero for something that definitely won't happen to one to for something that's certain. And so now our actions, we don't know what the outcome will be. If we do action A, if E happens, we'll get outcome 01. If E star happens, we'll get outcome 03. So now we don't know what the outcome will be. So even if we've managed to put these outcomes in order, that doesn't straight away tell us which action we should take necessarily. It might be that you prefer outcome 03 to outcome 04 but that you prefer O2 to O1. And now here we need to think about the probabilities. So if you prefer O2 to O1, well, you're quite likely to get O2 if you do B and O1 if you do A, because the probability E is high. So we need to weigh that quite heavily. And the way that people standardly calculate the value, it, what they standardly do is calculate the expected value of an action. So this is just like a kind of average of the outcomes, but weighted by the probabilities. So the expected value of A would be 0.7 times the value of O1 plus, point, plus 0.3 times the value of O3. 
And you'll see here straight away that there can be a problem, right, in saying what the expected value of an action is. Where do we get these numbers from? Um, because now it's not just an order that we need, actually. We need, um, well, it's called cardinal measurement so that we can say um, the difference between 04 and 03 is twice as big as the difference between 03 and 02 and so on. So here's just a concrete example. So this is obviously, this couldn't be simpler. This is like a textbook decision-making case. Um, and it only affects you. Um, you have to choose between these two actions. Um, I'll toss a coin and you'll get 10 pounds of heads and nothing otherwise. Um, or you get a straight six pounds. Um, and you can think about which action you would choose if we calculate our expected values, then we might say, well, the expected value of this action is half a chance of getting 10 and half a chance of getting nothing. So overall, that's value of five. Whereas here, we get a straight six. And then the standard, the most classic decision-making rule is maximize expected value. So here, you'd, you'd do six because it's higher than five. So you'll take the six pounds. So that's how it works in a textbook case. And now I just want us to think about what would happen in cases of severe uncertainty, which all of the cases of crisis and catastrophe that I can think of would fit into. Um, one of the projects that we've worked on at the LSE philosophy department, along with the economics department, is about how to cope in these conditions of severe uncertainty. And there's all sorts of barriers here to standard decision making. So first of all, maybe we don't know how to compare the different outcomes. So here your outcomes were just an amount of money that you get. I actually cheated here, you know, because I assumed the value of six pounds was six and the value of half the value of 10 pounds was five. That might not be right. It might be that the six pounds is incredibly important to you and don't really care whether it's six or ten. You really need that six. So even here, it can be hard to compare the different outcomes. But in a real life cases, uh, it's obviously incredibly difficult. How do you compare um, a situation where many people die with a situation where democracy in a whole country is undermined, how are we going to put numbers on those values? Where would those numbers come from? A second problem is that we might not even know what the outcomes are. Um, so we haven't even been able to think of all the outcomes that could occur. You might not be able to think what the worst case scenario is, for example. Another problem is that you might not have objective chances to put in here? Where are you going to get these probabilities from? And we see this in particular, what well, a particular case where we see it is in climate change, because we're trying to calculate the probability of various different events. How likely is it that this country will flood? And there's many scientific climate science models, but they give different results. So unless you can unless you have a reason for choosing one of these models you're not going to have a single number here for your probabilities you might have a range instead so we don't have these numbers um, and if you have a range you have to rethink how to calculate your expected values then we don't necessarily even know what the range of events are um, we've, we might just think about all the different things that could happen but some of the things that could happen won't even occur to us. So we won't have a complete list of events here. In the literature, we call this being unaware of some possibility. Um, and then finally, you might not know which actions are available to you. When you're deciding what to do in a time of crisis, you might list all the possible things that you can think of. But of course, there might be other actions that are available to you that you haven't even thought of, or it might be that some of the actions that you think you can do, um, you can't actually do. So we don't have a complete list of actions. So I know this sounds a bit uh, doom and gloom. I'm saying that um, 
the normal ways that we make decisions are all much more difficult in a time of crisis. We don't have the numbers to plug in. Um, but there's also an opportunity here to come up with new ways of making these decisions, to have a think about what you do when you don't know the objective chances, um, different ways of coming up with the possible list of events and so on. Um, and those are some of the things that our Managing Severe Uncertainty Group are working on, um, which I hope could help in some of the conditions of severe uncertainty. Okay, I'll just stop sharing and uh, return to the group, hopefully. Let me see, yes. I'll hand back to you, Bender. I think you're mute. <laughs> Benda, I think you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Now, I was just saying we have another very enthusiastic panel member that joined us. I don't think how I don't know how valuable his input's going to be, other than being a distraction. But thank you very much, Anna. Um, that was very useful, and it really does throw into relief just the concrete challenges we face, even if we if we try to quantify. Um, ethical decision making or moral decision making in terms of um, likely outcomes and un or more unlikely outcomes and probabilities. Um, I don't know, Christine, um, um, both of you mentioned um, that there were certain things that the others said that resonated with you. And I, I, I was wondering, Christine, if you have an initial response, if something that Anna said um, might have resonated with you um, in terms of um, the, the three principles that you put forward, because I was wondering, um, you know, when you when you talk about um, purpose, um, principles, and uh, prioritize, and you then um, link that back to um, how difficult it is to calculate and estimate the probability of certain outcomes. How is it that you advise your clients in the business world? to go about deciding upon principles and priorities? Um, yes, absolutely. Benda, thank you so much um, for the question. And Anna, thank you so much for your talk. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, so I think the first thing is maybe to say that um, coming up with principles in and of itself is the first challenge you're facing, right? What are the principles according to which a business wants to conduct their business? Let's say um, something that is uni usually universally agreed upon is to say that any form of human rights violations is like a red line. This is a principle that is going to be upheld by the company if that is going to be crossed in some capacity. This is a red line for, for a principle. Then we have other principles, for example, that might be more important to some businesses than to others. Let's say um, safety. Safety might be an important, um, both psychological as well as physical safety might be um, an important um, uh, principle to a company, such as, for example, also inclusion, to always work inclusively um, in terms of like the different stakeholders involved. So the one challenge is to come up, what is the right set of principles for this specific company? The greater challenge, though, is not to come up with these principles, but to really take these principles and what we call operationalize them. So how do you turn these principles into concrete um, guides that can be operationalized so they can be put into action? That is actually, Anna, I think, where you and I are meeting, as well as around the point of prioritization, as how do you go about going from the, as you said, like the textbook examples, I can write it down for you, to really um, guiding um, leaders in making difficult decisions. And what we have done, for example, for one of um, uh, our clients is to come up with a decision-making framework on the basis of uh, principles. And what we had done was trying to, I know what you were talking about, try to put specific weightings to um, certain outcomes, certain principles, um, such as, as I said, um, we were considering the severity, we were um, considering how likely it is, um, the impact, who's going to be impacted by it. And what we then had done is after we had composed this decision-making framework is we had come up with a list of um, some 25 um, uh, possible scenarios, um, such as um, it could be 
uh, working um, with the Chinese government, for example. Um, it could be um, working with um, someone who is trading in arm deals. Um, if they want to be your customer, what sort of decisions do you make around that? So all kinds of different scenarios. And then we were just feeding it through um, the, 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 the waiting, so to speak, and the prioritization that we had conducted in order to fine tune um, the, the, the kind of framework that we had built that is in line with the objectives that the business has and the purpose that it has and serves. So there I was really trying to take this, operationalize it, test it um, in very extreme cases, fine tune it in order to then have some um, blueprint to be able to make decisions going forward, particularly when they're very hard decisions. That sounds, may I respond, Benda? Yeah, yeah I, I, that sounds really useful That's yeah. not, because it's so concrete, right? And mm. because it's always the case, isn't it, that you come up with um, you come up with principles or mm. uh, I mean, I, I'm even thinking when you're coming up with a new way of that just uh, in the department, we might say, oh, from now on, we're going to mark essays using this system. And then it's like, but it doesn't really do anything until you've thought about the cases, mm. individual cases. So that sounds really powerful. And um, I have a question about the yeah, whole idea of principles, actually, because mm. um, uh, because there's this problem for in, in ethics. I think um, we have some ethicists who are consequentialists and are thinking about the possible outcomes. And I guess that I'm kind of intuitively that kind of that which is why i think of it in terms of outcomes and the probabilities of outcomes mm. and then you have ethicists who work with principles so you know like it's a red line no killing no matter what the outcome might be mm. if i kill one person and i save a hundred no killing it's just my principle and um i always feel like there's a problem for this second principled approach which is that um, you have to factor in the probabilities. So what do you do, not when you're certain to kill someone if you do an action, but when there's a, a tiny probability of it? Mm -hmm. If it's a red line, no killing, then does that mean that even though I've, you know, I've triple checked that this, um, this warehouse that's filled with um, weapons has got nobody in it, I've, I've, I've checked that very, very carefully, and it seems like I could safely bomb it and no harm would come to anyone. But there is a chance that there's a person I've missed, in which mm. case I would then be violating my, you know, no, no killing or no violation of human rights rule. So how does how does this principled approach fit with this sort of uncertainty? Mm. No, I think it's a very good question. And I have to say that principles are not just the only, that is one approach you obviously take to, to decision making. And I think what we see in, in life contexts such as business is you will have to draw on very, like on different things in order to, to be good at making decisions. And so it's not just like pure, there are just principles and we won't consider anything else. That is not at all the point that, that, that I was trying to bring across. Um, because it's also, for example, the example that I was given with, um, uh, uh, the, the Chinese government, for example, or um, weapons manufacturer, that was an example of when a business says, who should we work together with? Who should we allow to use our um, uh, products, for example, or our services? So they are looking for um, um, uh, like uh, answers to questions like this. So that in that case, um, it wouldn't be, there is a, a small possibility that within a warehouse something is happening, but it's more there is a weapons manufacturer. Should we be working with a weapons manufacturer? Should we be working with um, private prisons? Should we? These are like big ethical questions as they're, they're large customers. Um, there is a great financial incentive for business to obviously, for some businesses such as technology companies, to work with, with them. Um, but should they be doing it? And that's their question like, how can we navigate? these questions um and knowing um whether this is um the, the right kind of like relationships and customers for us so that was like in in relation to that kind of um question um and so i think like we we so for example when we work and this is this is not crisis related at all though um 
So when we're working much more in the technology sector where we're thinking about artificial intelligence, for example, how do you responsibly innovate artificial intelligence? Um, then we are much more thinking about um, the outcomes and the consequences of innovation. Whereas like there, we, d we take a less principled approach. We are much more driven by what are the potential outcomes of that, trying to understand that. And therefore then the, the decision-making is guided by that. So it's not always like a pure approach. It's more what is needed in a, in a particular context um, within, within a set of business questions that, that, is at, that is at hand, yes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's kind of pragmatic. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. And I can really see how the case studies would work because yeah, my mm. worry was that with the principles, it's so abstract. And then, and yes. then yeah, but when you add in the case studies, yeah, that's a really important step, I guess. Yes, 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 absolutely. Because like I think that we are seeing a larger, um, especially because because I work a lot within technology, we see a lot um, a shift um, from from going here, all the guidelines and the principles and all the values, and we have debated them for a few years now, but then nobody knows what to do with it. And now much more comes the time of like, how do we operationalize this? How can we actually use this? Um, because it is often what we see that um, within um, academia, that academics come up, for example, with great principles and, and guidelines, and you give them to business and they're like, I have no idea how to translate um the the theories you have been coming up with into my day-to-day -day practice when i am trying to to come up with products like how how are we going to do this so i think that we overall see um both within um academic writing and academic research um as well as in in praxis much more a shift towards really um what does this look like put into action and i think it's it's a very vital and necessary step um and um, a very exciting, um, but also challenging moment. And we're currently in, in how to, um, uh, yes, translate translate um, principles and all that into, into action. So in other words, if uh, within the context of business, when you talk about principles, this is actually not what we would call in philosophy, a sort of a pure deontological approach. No, no, um, no, 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 no. And, and um, I was thinking, um, call yourself a consequentialist um, honor. And and I was thinking um, a lot of what you talk, and I, th I think this also has relevance within the context of business and it has bearing on the entire problem around probability, is that um, this both of you in, in um, deciding um, courses of action when you're faced with ethical dilemmas and calculating probabilities, would probably also then um, uh, resort to um, what what would be the most likely best possible interest of all based on what experience has taught you. So in other words, work very much in the tradition of rule utilitarianism where you base your decisions on past dynamic trends. Uh, in other words, even if we don't know for absolutely certain this will be the outcome, Past trends have indicated that this is the most likely outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's inside your. Sorry, continue. No, no, no. I, I sorry. You, you. Fit, I had. I interrupted you. <laughs> no, I, I actually. I think you. You get the gist of what I'm saying. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, in response to that, one of the things that is so difficult is innovation, isn't it? Yes. Um, because you want to try something that, like, like, like happened in COVID, really, with the vaccinations um, that were rushed. Well, they weren't rushed through, but they happened much more quickly than the standard process. And there was a lot of innovation that got us there. And I think the vaccinations have been fantastic. Um, but to do that, you, you can't just rely on the past experience. You have to take yeah. it as a leap. And right. How how can we decide <laughs> when that's the right thing to do? And of course, war, as well as being a time of catastrophe, is a time of innovation, isn't it? Right. Any changes, in, not just in technology, but to society that have happened in times of war. Um, 
But I, but I would also like in relation to, to the war question, I think something that I have been very struck with um, over the last months and as um, the crisis in the Ukraine has unfolded is because there were obviously so many sanctions um, that were also being issued by governments. Many businesses felt the need um, to to make to take an ethical stance or to take some stance in relation to it, and for example, to decide to suspend operations within Russia. Um, and while on the one hand, um, many companies have been applauded for their approach to, to being principled, for example, to to making tough decisions during tough tough times. Um, I think what has also been a little bit like drowned out of the conversation is that it usually isn't the, the, the place for business to make a decision that is impacting during a, a time such as um, the invasion in the Ukraine, um, to make such decisions such as to suspend um, all of their um, uh, business within that country. And I think what we have seen is because so many businesses felt that they needed to do something that no one actually knew or knows what the impact mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. overall because usually sanctions like this are issued by governments and there are rules for it and they they have duties and um and business doesn't have that so there is no playbook for businesses to put sanctions onto other countries by suspending business and so the impact has been maybe seen as an as an isolated impact of, of the one business that I have to consider, but so many businesses have joined into this that has like now a cumulative effect of affecting a lot of the people who have nothing to do with the war mm -hmm. in terms of like luxury goods or what have you. So it doesn't hit the military, it doesn't hit the government, like the, the Russian military, it doesn't hit the Russian government, it hits civilians. Mm -hmm. And so I think we are also like at a, at a time where businesses take decisions where there is no rule book and, and how to think about these decisions and how to think about these decisions outside of your own business considerations, that this is also a time where we have to think about ethical decisions making in, in, a, in a much wider scope maybe um, than, than we previously would or would under other circumstances. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's um, something. Sorry, I just, I would just um, follow on from that. Um, I think that's a very important perspective but I was wondering, um, is is that not a, a, a kind of principled take that a business or a principled stand that a business takes? Um, protesting, in a sense, against mm -hmm. the loss of lives in war. Um, at the same time, it risks livelihoods, right? Because mm -hmm. I imagine jobs are then at risk, at stake. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the businesses that close in the country, such as um, Russia, um, or the company itself, say Starbucks, who, um, who feels maybe Starbucks is a bad example because it probably won't feel the pinch that badly. Um, but a company that feels the, that does feel the impact of uh, um, stopping operations in a country like Ukraine, for example. So again, um, we see, as in the pandemic with the lockdown measures, we see that uh, conflict between how to weigh lives versus livelihoods. Right. Yes. yes, absolutely. Anna, you, you wanted to say something as well? Um, no, I think, I think actually Ben just covered it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because, because I also think like, obviously, one of the considerations is just who um, who are you affecting with the decisions that you're making? On the one hand, you can say you're um, orientating yourself against wanting to make a principled stance against Russia. But on the other hand, it's obviously what are the sort of like goods that you're providing um, with, within Russia. So, for example, um, companies that have obviously um, deal in luxury goods have a very different decision to make than companies who deal um, with very important infrastructure or provisions, be that food related, medicine related, um, or, or like whatever it might be. That's obviously a 
the, are these the companies that we also want to make a principled um, stance mm -hmm. against Russia? Probably not, because they are, the impacts um, are very different. So not every company can just make a principled stance in relation to what happens in Russia, but it also needs to be obviously considered in relation to who is affected by it, what sort of businesses are there, and what does it mean if, if several of, let's say, your competitors make, make a similar decision within the same, within that space. So I think then, um, they, that kind of decision making has just become that that much more complex, so to speak, because just the principled approach, for example, is no longer what what is really um, applicable, or one has to revisit the kind of principles one has according to which one wants to operate on. Yeah. Right. Um, ladies, our time has elapsed. Um, can I perhaps just ask um, uh, Christine one last question? Um, this is a question I have because I'm teaching an introduction to moral philosophy course to economics and management uh, um, sciences students at second year level mm -hmm. and um, trying to, um, it, it's almost as if I'm trying to teach them principles or answers to questions that they don't have because mm -hmm. I'm, uh, it's a generation. It's, it's you can you can imagine the generation of students at a second year level at this point. How old are they? Nineteen, twenty years mm -hmm. old. Um, uh, we are living in a, a post apartheid South Africa where there's a lot of corruption. Um, yeah. There's a lot of bad leadership. Um, there's a lot of poverty, huge inequality between rich and poor, and uh, most. Um, um, one of the things that they brought to the fore is it's a generation that has been left in the lurch by their parents. In other mm -hmm. words, there was the uh, libert uh, liberation struggle, and then you had the uh, people that came in power as a result of that, and it's those leaders that actually dis um, uh, um, left this generation that I'm speaking about in the lurch by hmm. um, seeing to it that infrastructure goes to ruin, that, um, uh, um, you know, that is uh, merciless in the um, unapologetic corruption and so forth and so on. And in this context, I'm teaching, I'm trying to teach them, you know, the basic principles of ethical decision making and um, hmm. ethical theories. And um, you said something that because i one of the questions that i often ask them is um what is the point of business is business just mm. business or is business is business just about profit generation or is there is there mm. more at stake in business and more often than not it's um you know it sounds cynical they would admit but business is about making money and the world mm. out there is cutthroat and dealing straight is not going to necessarily get me where I want to be because this is not mm. the example that has been set for me. Mm. Um, and you were talking about, um, you know, the fact that there has become an increasing awareness that mm -hmm. um, there's no, there, it's no longer um, a viable business model to think of it purely in terms of shareholder returns. Yeah. Um, but we need broader definitions of value that encompass yeah. that uh, encompasses a company's impact on all the stakeholders. And now yeah. to you and I, this sounds commonsensical because of, obviously we have to think of future generations. We have to think um, of all the stakeholders involved, including the environment. And yeah. then, of course, sustainability comes into it. But how do I get this across to, a, to an audience that seems to um, not buy into it? To, to them, it sounds like these beautiful, um, you know, um, ideals, but it has no purchase in the world in which they've been raised and in which they live. Um, so I absolutely fully sympathize um, with maybe a sort of sense of disillusionment that there could be something other than just finance and profit that is running the world, because that is indeed the world that one has been brought up in. And I think that there are two responses to that. One is 
by believing that that is the case, one is also perpetuating the idea that that should be the case, right? So someone needs to obviously make a break and 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 have a different demand even onto onto business. I think that's the first step is to empower people to say we can have a different demand onto business um, because the decisions that they are making have such a large impact on onto the planet, onto society um, that we should be making this um, this demand. I think it's empowering people to, to do that. And why I think this is important is because we have um, in the last few years particularly seen that when people have made this demand, it has made an impact onto business. So this idea is, so they are absolutely right that business up until a few years was all just about profit, was all just about satisfying um, shareholders. However, because a lot of pressure has been put on some by regulatory bodies, but mainly really by employees, communities, society who have stood up as a collective and said, this no longer is acceptable. We have to demand more of you. So, for example, I think the best example is technology companies. You have social media platforms that have started so small that have become really the, the town square for public debates, the power that they're holding, not just financial power, but the power they're holding over our lives is tremendous. And it is often that employees have risked everything um, to stand up against this company and say, this is, you need to do better. You have a greater responsibility. And it is through that pushback that we have really seen a difference within business in awareness of ethical decision-making, in awareness of ethics, in awareness that they have to give back as well, in awareness of the duties even that they have towards other people and the planet. So I think it is only really from a push down because we can't be waiting for, for regulation to kick in. It is really that people need to believe that they can make a difference because we have seen that it does make a difference. And I think it is continuously pushing for that. Thank you very much. I think I will definitely um, try my best to impart that ma message. You are obviously very passionate about what you I, uh, do, which is great to see. Um, Anna, did you want to add anything? No, I really like that. Yeah. I think that's uh, given me something to think about. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much, and Anna. I would definitely have to go back and and read specifically about um, like ethical decision making in, in a much smaller way. Because when I think about ethical decision making, I think about decisions that are like this big. And I think that the focus that you have brought um, is such a beautiful way of of really sharpening the minds um, to to a specific question. Um, so I'd be definitely going back to revisit that. Um, Benda, also thank you so much for your wonderful introduction. I'm writing on Lebanon in my PhD, so um, I very much appreciated what you were saying. Yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, yeah, thank, uh, you thank you so much. much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Nice. No, thank you to both of you that you were willing to see it through. Um, Absolutely. That you were brave enough to uh, take the stand, even though the, the others deserted us. I think our panel turned out to work very nicely. Yeah, I think so too. I think it was the right side. Yes, I think yes, so. exactly. We had, we had each had enough time to actually take our time and to flesh out some ideas that mm -hmm. emerged instead of just yeah. rushing through small little introductory talks. So I think I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to stop streaming. I don't know if I'm going to lose you. Or whether I'll just stop the recording. But in case I lose you, thank you so much. And I really hope we um, get an opportunity to meet again somehow, somewhere. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you both so much. And then enjoy your evening, okay? And both of you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.